Okay, we're going to start? Thank you. Um, so we'll, today we're going to go through some, some proofs. And um, these uh, demand a lot of attention. And um, yeah, I forgot the chalk. Let me get the chalk. equal to 
lambda V minus delta N on N. And in particular, this tells us that zero, of course, is N zero on this to the left, EN zero minus H zero N, because the N zero is an eigenstate of H zero with an eigenvalue EN zero, so this cancels. And that means that N zero is orthogonal to this state, lambda V minus delta N on N, so orthogonal to N zero. This is something that we'll be using later. It may not be apparent why it's such an important thing at the moment. One reason, kind of, is that that means that this operator has a zero eigenvalue, so we can't just form the inverse of that operator. We can't just say N is one over. In other words, we can't just say N is one over EN zero minus H zero on lambda V minus delta N N. So this won't work. No, it won't do. On the other hand, we can do something close to it if we just avoid this energy level N zero that is a zero of this operator, and then this division will be okay. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use a projection operator. This, my notes have used a Greek letter. I'm going to switch to a projection operator. It's sort of a orthogonal projection operator. It's one minus N zero N zero. And one, then, is the sum on all these states. Let me call them K. So we subtract the adding N zero N zero from the identity, and that just gives us the sum K not equal to, I guess it's K not equal to N of K zero K zero. So this is a projection operator that's orthogonal to the state that's the N value state of H zero N zero. And that projection operator, then, behaves like this. One over E N zero minus H zero P N is the same thing as P N one over E N zero minus H zero. And it is just the sum of K not equal to N of K zero K zero over E N zero minus E K zero. That is to say, these K's are eigenstates of H zero, so they just kick out a K zero down here. So this is a structure that we can deal with. Sorry about my eyes. I'm going to get some allergy to everything that grows in New Mexico. So what are we going to try? Well, we're going to try, instead of trying this, we're going to try the following. We're going to say that N, in fact, there's sort of a song and dance here in the notes, but it seems to me that we can deal with this later. I'm just going to write it this way. So this is the equation that we expect. In other words, instead of this equation, which 
is kind of right in spirit. We're going to put in the projection operator so that this inverse operator makes sense. And then we're going to take, take advantage of the fact that when, 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 as lambda goes to 0, this um, coefficient here, I mean, the state goes to n0. Now, literally, we should put in a, a, a uh, parameter here that depends upon lambda. But that only affects basically the overall normalization. So, um, and we're going to set that equal to 1. That's just to simplify the notation. So, when, so the state n that we find by this equation, solving this equation, isn't going to be normalized. But uh, we can worry about that later and normalize it. So this is, uh, this is the, the equation that, um, that we want to solve. And um, we can, we now know that um, just over here, this, this, this equation which we use to motivate this song and dance actually tells us something. It tells us that, that uh, of course, the equation was 0 is um, n0 lambda v minus delta n n. That's equal to 0. But that is just the inner pro uh, that is just n0, or rather, let me, let me just be a little more careful here. Lambda is a constant, so it's n0 v n minus delta n n0 n. But n0 n is 1 here, and it's 0 over there, so it's just 1. And so we get the equation delta n is equal to lambda n0 v n. Uh, OK, so that's, that's our, that's in fact an exact uh, formula um, for uh, delta n. And we're going to use that as one of our equations. Now, what we want to do is we want to check that this gives us a state n that, uh, although unnormalized, is nonetheless an eigenstate of the total Hamiltonian h0 plus lambda v. And so what we're going to do is um, we're going to take en0 minus h0 on n. And um, that is going to cancel this first term. It's going to cancel that. And this is going to be equal to p sub n times lambda v minus delta n n. But on the other hand, we know that lambda v minus delta n, n is orthogonal to n0 anyway, so this projection operator doesn't have any effect. So we can rewrite that as lambda v minus delta n on n. That is to say, lambda v minus delta n is already orthogonal to n0, so adding the projection operator that projects onto the space the subspace that's orthogonal to n0 has no effect. And now if we just unscramble this equation, uh, what we see is that this tells that we move the h0 over here and the delta n over there. We just see that that's the equation h0 plus n v on n is equal to uh, e0 plus delta n n, which is to say equal to e n. So indeed, this, if we solve this equation, what we have is a uh, solution. We have a, 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 an eigenstate of Hamiltonian, not normalized, but, uh, but it, uh, it, it, it part of normalization, which is always a, 
by comparison with everything else, it's a trivial thing to do. And um, so what we want to do now, now that we've set the stage for things, is we want to write delta n, which is the energy shift of the nth level, as a power series in lambda. And we want to set the unnormalized exact eigenstate of the uh, total Hamil n eigenstate of the total Hamiltonian. Remember, this is a non-degenerate problem where essentially assuming all the levels are non-degenerate. Uh, although the only one whose non-degeneracy plays any role in this, as far as I, at least in, as far as we're going to get in this series, uh, is the nth level. The others could be degenerate. Anyway, we're expanding that as a power series in uh, this the small dimensionless parameter lambda. All right, now let me erase some of this. Um, other. Are there any questions with this? Remember, I have candy in case anybody does ask a question. By the way, I should mention something. Next week, I have to go to a conference on biophysics in Boston. And it turns out that's going to overlap. It's going to kill the class on Monday and Wednesday. So the good news is there's a holiday in this course. The bad news is that we're going to have to make up the classes later at some point. Um, it's such a small class, we can we have a lot of freedom there. Right? We, we can make them up during spring break if you want. But why don't you guys think about when you want to make up the classes? Uh, in we could do them on Tuesdays, on Saturdays, or we could do some extra classes during exam week. Uh, instead of having an exam, we could have a class and so forth. We have a class on the so that so think about it and uh, send me email and talk talk with each other. There are, you know, not that many of you, so you did pretty well. both won Nobel Prizes. Um, Purcell certainly in physics. Ferg might have met, won his in medicine and physiology, uh, or it might have been in physics. <laughs> um, at any rate, Berg went, went to medical school at Harvard, and he hated it. And after a year or so, he dropped out, and he started hanging around the physics department at Harvard. And he came to admire Professor Purcell, who was a marvelous lecturer as well as a Nobel laureate in research. And um, there were things like NMR and and which became MRI and credited essentially to Purcell. And I think he may have been behind the 21 centimeter observation, observation of the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen and galactic and yeah, astronomy. In any event, um, Berg went to see Har uh, Purcell and said, Professor Purcell, could I work under you as a student? And Purcell said, um, well, he didn't think that would be a good idea because he didn't know what to do. In other words, Purcell said to Berg that he wasn't sure what to work on and so it wasn't a good idea for Berg to become a student because he didn't know what to work on. And um, I just find that a remarkable uh, story because um, it showed that one thing that it shows is that is that Purcell, instead of just working on whatever was an easy problem that he could knock off and make a paper. He was looking for something that he thought was worth working on. 
and that required him to remain fallow for a while and just think and uh, find a problem. And then after he found the problem, then he start working on it and look for a student or more or, or students who would work on it. Anyway, that's, that's a story I heard from Bert. I think it was during, it was either an after dinner speech or I met him at lunch and he told me that story. Anyway, it's um, an interesting story, I think. So in particular, we can take this sum then of uh, this power series and land expansion of the exact eigenstates, and we can stick it into this formula. And what we get then is lambda n0 v times n0 plus lambda n1 plus dot dot dot. And so that tells us that delta n is the sum. I have this written as k. That's probably a bad choice here. Um, let me call it L. L equals zero to infinity. L here is not angular momentum. Lambda to the L plus one N zero V N L. So that's our expression for the uh, energy shift. Of course, it doesn't do us any good at the moment, except to, when we recognize that if you set L equals zero here, then um, indeed that is the expression for the first order energy shift. Um, let's see, did I? Well, it gives us the expression for the first order energy shift. In other words, delta n zero is in fact um, simply n zero v n zero. So that comes out of that. Um, In other words, the general formula here is the elf term is n zero v n Okay. Now, um, what we want to do is um, substitute this uh, expansion here and that expansion into our uh, eigenvector equation here. And when we do, what we get is a sum, say L equals zero to infinity, lambda to the L, and L equals N zero plus PN over EN zero minus H zero, lambda V minus a sum, and I see in my notes I switched to L in this term. So um, let me call that P. P equals 1 to infinity. Lambda root P delta P to N on sum J equals 0 to infinity. Lambda J and J. Okay, so this is our... This is this equation which we checked is okay, uh, give us the right answer, together with these two power series uh, solutions, power series expansions. Now, in fact, it's just a matter of requiring that um, the coefficients on each side in other words, what we get out of this effectively is an infinite set of equations, one uh, proportional to lambda to the zeroth power, then lambda to the first power, lambda to the second power, lambda to the third power. We get an infinite set of equations. Equivalent, equivalently, we could differentiate this equation with respect to lambda of uh, uh, zero times, one times, two times, three times, four times, and then set lambda equal to zero, and we get an infinite set of equations because this is supposed to be an equation that's true for all real lambda, small real lambda. Um, on the other hand, we know that Pn on um, delta n, n zero obviously is zero. And so in particular, 
When this thing goes along here, this PN, it's going to knock off the, when it hits these guys, it's going to knock off the J equal to zero state. And so what we, what we, we can simplify this a little bit. It's the sum L equals zero to infinity, lambda to the L, N sub L equals N zero, plus, so we're going to split this up a little bit. It's going to be PN lambda V N zero. So the N zero state, in other words, only survives when it's protected by the potential from the projection operator. So this is EN zero minus H zero. And that's actually a bad way of writing it. Let me rewrite it. Lambda V N zero. Okay, and then the rest of it is plus C sub N over EN zero minus H zero, lambda V minus a sum. And now we can go from J equals one to infinity. Whoops, that's bad parenthesis. Okay, so now this is our equation. All right. So if we look at this, suppose we differentiate zero times, which is saving nothing, and just set lambda equal to zero, then what do we get? We get from this term, we get N zero equals N zero. And then over here, we just get zero. We get zero, we get zero. So this thing is consistent at the lambda equals zero level. What about lambda equal to one? Well, lambda equal to one, we get lambda N one, the first correction, equals P sub N over E N zero minus H zero times V times N zero, well, lambda V. And then, let's see, there's the rest of this actually cancels, but, um, ah, yes, the reason why, oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, you guys should have called me on this. I did not write this correctly. I skipped a term here. It's lambda V minus this sum p equals one to infinity lambda to the p delta p n times ooh, sum now j equals one to infinity lambda j and j. Okay, guys, not paying any more attention than I am. So the six of us have to shape up here. All right, so lambda equals one. Even what you see is since this has a lambda in it, and these guys both have lambda, this is at the lowest order on the right here is lambda squared. So it doesn't contribute. And this gives us a formula for the first order correction. And so the formula for the first order correction is obtained just by erasing lambda. So in other words, if I erase lambda here, I get this expression. So. Now what we've got then is we've got the, um, actually this was a mistake, you should have called me on this also. This is a one. Isn't it a one? Let me just make sure there's a standard nomenclature here. It's a little bit, okay, delta L is L minus one. Yeah, this is delta one. So we found earlier that the first order energy shift is just the mean value in the in the ground in the mean value in the end state of the potential, and now we find that the first order correction to the eigenstate is the projection operator on the space orthogonal to the nth level. This uh, thing here, which we could call a propagator, the potential, and then uh, the the state. So, in a sense, we've we've gone. I mean, we haven't solved the problem, but we've gone. Um, We've gone way into it. 
of that is to say we have the these are frankly the things that are used are most used. This is the equation that's that's um, in fact the most useful. It's also the simplest, and it's often true that the simplest thing is the most useful thing. Um, all right, now we want to go beyond that. Any questions? Now, we already have a formula over here for what delta Ln is. Namely, it's N0 B and L minus 1. But we now have N1 here. So that means that not only do we have the first order energy correction, but the first order correction of the state almost immediately gives us the first order correction of the energy. And so that means that delta 2n is equal to n0 v n1 and that's going to be n0 v pn pn minus h0 v n0 And if we insert a complete set of states, then what we find is delta 2n is equal to a sum k not equal to n, that's because of the projection operator, n0 v, n0, k0. And the k0 gives us the energy down here, en minus k0, v, n0. Or writing it in a somewhat nicer form is k0 v n0 absolute value squared over e n0 minus e k0. Okay, so that's a very nice formula for the second order energy correction. Frankly, it's rare in ordinary quantum mechanics problems that one goes beyond this. Um, you normally stop here. And um, you can see why, because this, in fact, is an infinite sum. And uh, you know, that's not a piece of cake, an infinite sum. And uh, if you're dealing with a harmonic oscillator, then you know you can probably bang this out without any trouble if V is completely pathological. But if you're talking about the hydrogen atom, then uh, this is another matter because um, these get to be pretty complicated functions. And uh, in fact, it's even worse than it works worse than it looks because this um, this sum here. This projection operator is the identity minus that state. But in the case of the hydrogen atom, the energy with this projection operator would not only be the sum over the bound states, but would be the sum over the continuum states. And that's a that's a that's a big deal. Schwinger worked it out in various, in various cases, but most people um, pass on to some other problem. All right, now let's let's look at this uh, and, and learn something very simple. Namely, let's look at the second order correction to the ground state. Remember, we're always in the case here where the end, no, I shouldn't say, that. yeah, the ground state. We're in this case where this, this uh, end state is um, non-degenerate. 
So it's K0 V N0 absolute value squared over E10 minus E K0. So E K0 is going to be greater than E10 because E K is one of the excited states. And it's the non-degeneracy that's coming in here, among other things. In fact, let me just mention about the non-degeneracy. You see, this particular form of the projection operator of the identity operator minus just the simple dyadic, that's only possible if this end state is non-degenerate. Otherwise, we have to subtract not only N0, but N01, N02, N03 if we're degenerate. Similarly here, all right, anyway, these are the excited states. This is the ground state, so this is always negative. So this whole thing is less than zero. So the second order correction to the ground state energy, no matter what the potential is, is negative. That's, by the way, a favorite question on, we have these various exams, preliminary qualifying exam, comprehensive exam. That's a favorite question on such exams. And I'm opposed to those kind of exams. Anyway, word to the wise. Appreciate this equation is your friend. Being on a first name basis. Okay, now let's look for N2. Well, we're going to go back and that's what I meant to say. Oh, sorry, yeah. We have an expression for N1 now. And we can put that expression for N1 in. You see, over here, we so far got away with not you, we got away with, how shall I say it? In this expression, we need to know what N1 is to go beyond it and find N2. And so what we're going to do is look at the lambda squared expression in here. And so if we do that, what we get is lambda 2, the second order correction to this nth energy level. And it's Pn over Pn0 minus, it's supposed to be H0, minus H0. And so this one obviously doesn't contribute. This one here can only contribute one factor of lambda, so it's out of the picture. And now this one can contribute along with that. And so what we get here is lambda V minus lambda delta N1. So we necessarily have one factor of lambda here, at least one factor of lambda. And so over here, we want exactly one factor of lambda. So what we get there is lambda N1, but we already know N1. Namely, N1 is given by this expression here. And so now we can substitute for that expression, divided by lambda squared, we get N2 is equal to P sub N over EN0 minus H0 V. Okay, I'm going to separate these two terms. And now N1 gives us a P sub N over EN0 minus H0 V N0. So that's the first term. And then this one gives us a minus P sub N 
over EN0 minus H0, N0, E, N0, P sub N, V, N0, and then over, let me put this over to the left here, EN0 minus H0. In other words, we have to use, first of all, our expression for delta 1N, our expression for delta 1N, you remember, was N0, V, N0, and so that's our, that's the, this is the, this is delta N1, so this is a common parenthesis, it's not part of the equation, maybe I can actually do this. That's delta N1, and then N1, the state, is PN over EN0 minus H0, V, N0, and so that goes over here. So that's, that's the expression for N2. So it's a kind of unwieldy, not that unwieldy. You can see that this isn't something that, going beyond second order is going to be certainly a chore, that's obvious. All right, let me get, let me erase this and write this in a couple of different ways. All right. So there are two more ways of writing this. N2 is a sum on, let's say, K and L, not in both numbers, Q0, and in other words, we've got these, these V's here, and this is going to be a sum over the K0s, a sum over the L0s, so we're going to get expressions of the form K0, V0, K0, V, L. So we're going to say K0, V, L0, and we're going to write it as V, K, L. And so this is V, K, L over E, N, L minus E, K0. And then V, L, N, because we're going to have an N0, V, L0, so that's V, L, N, and that's going to be E, N0 minus E, L0. So that's this term. And then it's going to be minus the sum K0 to N. So in this term here, we just have one sum, and that gives us a K0 and V, N, N. This is the same thing as V, N, N in this notation. And then the V, K, N from this projection operator here. And in fact, these two projection operators, since this is just a number, these two projection operators just become one projection operator. So this, in other words, as for any projection operator, P, N squared is equal to P, N. Does anybody, do you guys want to see this? All right. And then what we have here in the denominator is E, N, 0 minus E, K, 
to the end of the curve to the left. And delta 2 of the bottom level due to the top level is going to be the same numerator, dt squared over eb0 minus dt0. So the point is that the second order shift for the top level due to the bottom level and the bottom level due to the top level, in magnitude they're the same, because these absolute values are the same. And the denominators also in magnitude are the same. So these things in magnitude are the same, but they're, what are they? This is positive, and this one is negative, because, so this is less than 0, and this is greater than 0. Or to write it differently, this is equal to the absolute value of delta 2 tb equals the absolute value of delta 2 bt, and this is equal to minus the absolute value of delta 2 tb, which is minus the absolute value of delta 2 bt. So this is negative, this is positive, and so what you say is that to, as you turn on the perturbation, the effect of the second order, these levels, which might have been here at land equal 0, they change in various ways, but when you get to the lambda squared, they repel each other. And how do they repel each other? Well, the closer the two are to each other, the smaller this denominator, the more they repel each other. So nearby levels repel each other, but any pair of levels is repelling in second order. So now let's get to another topic here. I wish I had come up with more jokes and stories. I seem to be out of jokes and stories. I usually have a whole raft of tangents. The normalized exact energy state, we're going to say, is z sub n to the 1 half times the thing that we've got that's not normalized. And this is a notation borrowed from the normalization theory. So that's the n1 that is equal to n, n sub n. And that's going to be z sub n to the 1 half times n sub n, n. So this is the unnormalized one. And we said, we took as a condition that n0, n, was equal to 1. That's the way we set it up over there. By that equation way up there. So what is n0, n sub n? Well, n0, n sub n, then, is z sub n to the 1 half n0, n. On the other hand, that is itself equal to 1. So this is just dn to the 1 half. The way we've set things up, n0, n, n0, n normalized is z to the 1 half. Now, 1 is equal to n, n, n sub n. And that is this, z sub n, n, n. And so that tells us that n, n 
is one over the e sub n. And what is this n sub n? Well, it's going to be something like this. It's going to be n0 plus lambda n1 plus dot 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 on n0 plus lambda n1 plus dot dot dot. And so to lowest order then, this nn, which is one over zn, is equal to one plus lambda squared n1 n1. N0, of course, is perpendicular to n1, as you can see from these various expressions we've drawn here. Do you want me to show you why n0 is perpendicular to n1? So that's our expression. And what is n1? This is then 1 plus lambda squared. We have expressions over there for n1, and that is n0 v pn over en0 minus h0 squared times v times n0. And let me just erase this and get some more space here. And so that tells us that z sub n is equal to, and of course this is approximately equal to, let me do z n inverse, because that's what we're doing right now, is 1 plus lambda squared sum over k not equal to n, v n k f sub n squared over e n 0 minus k 0 squared. Well, at least we know what the sign of that is. It's positive. And moreover, the whole thing of perturbation theory, by the way, is that we're thinking of lambda being so small that it dominates everything. And so despite the fact that it's an infinite series, we're going to say this is small, because it's multiplied by lambda squared. So that tells us that z n is approximately 1 minus lambda squared times the same thing, k not equal to n, v k n n k squared over v n 0 minus k 0 squared. So, so that's our expression for z n. As lambda goes to 0, it just goes to 1, and it's also clearly less than 1. And so, so remember that z n itself is equal to n sub n, n 0, absolute value squared. That's here, n 0, n sub n is z n to the 1 half. So this thing is the probability that the overlap between the nth eigenstate of h 0 and the exact normalized nth eigenstate of n 0. That is, of course, less than 1, as we expect, and it's this particular expression. And so the stronger the coupling is, then the more n 0 leaks out into, or the more the other levels have to be, come to play a role in the exact eigenstate. So the stronger the coupling, the more other states, and the less the contribution of n 0. All right, and then finally, one other thing that we can do is we can look at our formula for e n. And it's equation 
page 34 in my notes here. Where is that? Yeah, this expression right here. And we can see that this is, this expression here is a derivative of EN0 with respect to, EN with respect to EN0. In other words, this ZN, in fact, is partial of EN with respect to EN0. But we only computed this to second order here. In other words, all this computation was from just taking the lowest order term in this huge inner product. But this is, in fact, 1 minus lambda squared sum EKN after lambda squared over EN0 minus lambda squared. All right, so that's, that's, that's the end of the story for the non-degenerate case. We have time, I think, for an example and for a few more remarks here. How would we do this if we weren't doing perturbation theory? What's another way of going about finding the eigenstates and eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian? And one way is to say, well, you just take, you, you would do the following. You, you'd make a projection operator again. And I've used up P as a certain projection operator. Let me use something else. Let's use pi. All right, so we have a pi sub n is going to be the sum K equals 0 capital N. K0, K0. So we're just going from the ground state up. This is a projection operator on part of the Hilbert space. And we can then say, we can call H hat, H hat sub N say is pi hat H, pi sub N H, pi sub N. So this is, what we've done is we've effectively taken this mysterious full Hamiltonian and we've turned it into an N by N matrix effectively. And now we can talk about solving the character, well, I forget what the name of this is, but you know, H sub N minus E times the identity. This will give us all of the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And this is not crazy, especially with modern computers. As long as you can find, and these states don't have to be the eigenstates of the bare Hamiltonian. They can be just any convenient set of states that are, say, orthonormal to make things simple. And then you just take, you truncate, so you make this a finite dimensional problem. Once you have a finite dimensional problem, these computers can whack that away as long as you can compute what the hell this is. You then, in other words, as long as you can compute H hat KL, which is this K0 H L0, as long as you can compute these for the first 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 values. Anyway, let's just imagine this is a Gadamian experiment. I actually used an early version of MATLAB to carry this out for an anharmonic oscillator. And what happened was the results were that for the low eigenstates, the answers were superb. But as I got up to, suppose it was 100 by 100 matrix. As I got up to maybe 75 or so, there were spurious states that started to come in. And 
Anyway, as you let the size of this thing go and get larger and larger, though, typically the values you get for the low states are extremely good and the eigenvalues are extremely good. Yeah, all right. Another way of writing this, let me just do this quickly then. You saw we have this plus Pn over Pn0 minus H0, lambda B minus delta N. And that's our basic equation. We can rewrite this pulling the N over to one side as 1 minus Pn over Pn0 minus H0, lambda B minus delta N. We use light brackets like that. N equals N0. And that tells us that N is 1 minus Pn over Pn0 minus H0, lambda B minus delta N, inverse N0. So that's sort of a closed form solution. And you can, the inverse of something like this, well, that is just a sum K equals 0 to infinity, P sub N over Pn0 minus H0, lambda B minus delta N to the N, N0. So this gives you a formal expression for the unnormalized exact eigenstate of the Reynolds domain. Okay, that's that. Any questions? We've got a few minutes. I don't know if we can squeeze in this example. So if somebody would like something explained more clearly, we've got four or five minutes to do an explanation, or I can try to do the example. All right, the example is the quadratic Stark effect in the ground state of hydrogen. So as usual, we have our P squared over 2 mu, mu the reduced mass, minus E squared over R, and the potential term times the dimensionless parameter is going to be E, E, Z. So I guess the lambda, well, the lambda, I don't know. I mean, it's, you have to sort of restructure that to get E, but anyway. So E is an external electric field. And why is this, what's the first order effect? Well, the first order effect, 1, 0, 0 on the ground state, 1, 0, 0 is just 0, as we saw last time. And so delta 1, 1 is 0. I guess we're using 1 for the ground state here, and then over here I use 0 for the ground state. Maybe it'd be better to go 1 to infinity than 1 for the ground state. Anyway, I don't know if that's not important. What's the second order correction? Well, from the formulas that we derived, the second order correction to the ground state, 1, 0, 0, is going to be E squared, E squared, a sum N not equal to 1, all L and M, N, L, M, Z, 1, 0, 0, absolutely squared over E, 1, 0, minus E, N, 0. So that's our expression. And you see these guys are all greater than that, so this is, of course, negative. 
All right. I don't know how far we're going to get with this today. Um, well, let me just define the dipole moment. The dipole moment is going to be the mean value of, in any state, it's minus ER psi, where E is taken to be positive. And um, we've got our formulas for, I'm trying to avoid writing them down again, but our, our formula here for psi will be 1, 0, 0 plus E E times the sum N not equal to 1, or L and M, N L M, N L M, Z one zero zero divided by E one zero minus E N zero. And of course E N zero is a very very simple form. And uh, so the dipole is the inner product of these the, the mean value of the R of the position vector in this state and the mean value in uh, of the ground state of this in the ground state of course is zero and so what you've got is you get these various cross terms and um, I think I'm going to stop there and just start again because I don't want to keep you guys over time uh, so we'll we'll um, I'll, I'll just do the second order Stark effect uh, on Wednesday. And, um, so any questions?